Locked On Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked On Sports Today. Malik Willis flashes his talent in his debut for the Titans. The Giants got the Brian Dayball era off on the right foot with a preseason victory. And KD is liking Boston now? I'm Peter Bukowski, starting your day with the can't miss stories and biggest debates in sports. You're locked on sports today. Searching all major sports. Found. Let's start with the biggest story. The Baltimore Ravens did what the Baltimore Ravens always do. They won a preseason game their 21st straight, 23 to 10, over the Tennessee Titans. But the big storyline from Thursday night was the debut of Malik Willis. He finishes 6 of 11 for 107 and also had a dynamic touchdown run. Joining me now from Locked on Titans, Tyler Rowland and, and Ty, this was the anticipated debut of this game on either side of the field. I think from Willis, we saw a guy who has the talent but needs some time. What did you make of his NFL debut? Well, I thought that we saw everything that we would have expected to see from Malik Willis, or maybe expected isn't the right word, but that you would want to see from Malik Willis. Number one, he got the start. And if you're somebody outside of Tennessee, you may be thinking, oh, well, duh, he's a third-round rookie quarterback. You got Ryan Tannehill. He's quarterback, too. But one of the big things that I have been harping on throughout the beginning of training camp is that the Titans feel some sense of misplaced loyalty to their current backup quarterback, Logan Woodside, who simply isn't an NFL quarterback in terms of talent and traits. So, um, you know, everybody was like, oh, well, you know, how much should we expect? from Malik if we see him with the team not really wanting to put him as the backup, but you saw it. The touchdown run made a few guys miss, evaded pressure in the pocket on a pass play that didn't work out. That's the mobility and the playmaking that you knew, knew you'd get from him. But you see the arm strength as well on the 48-yard throw to Racy McMath down the field. You see a pinpoint throw in a tough situation on a corner route to the sideline for 20 yards when the clock is ticking down at the end of the first half to Mason Kinsey. You saw other avoided sacks in the pocket where guys look like they got him and he's getting away and making plays. You see him getting that angled pass to the tight end where he's throwing the sidearm angle. I mean, arm angles, mobility, playmaking, arm strength, making all the throws all over the field horizontally. He gave you everything. Now there's a near pick six on the first drive. He didn't slide on a five-yard run. He should have thrown it away, and he took a sack with the clock ticking down in the second half. Uh, He missed Traylon Burks open on a sack that he took on second and eight. Mike Vrabel said after the game, You know, we wanted him to throw the ball more and run less, and we got to look at the timing. So there's ups and downs. But at the end of the day, the only 10 points that the Titans scored against the preseason dynasty of the Baltimore Ravens was when Malik Willis was out there making plays. A seven-play, 72-yard touchdown drive was the best moment of the night for the Titans, and it was led by Malik Willis. He is clearly a superior football player to Logan Woodside. And no, I don't expect him to overtake... Ryan Tannehill this year, but he clearly should be quarterback too for the Titans, and it gives them the ability to use him in some packages to use that mobility throughout the year as well. Am I wrong for thinking this is kind of the best case scenario for the Titans in that if he comes out and just lights the preseason on fire, now we have to have these conversations of, wait, should Malik Willis just be the guy and then you're stuck with Ryan Tannehill, you're paying him a boatload of money in Tennessee, Instead, you've got a guy who shows the flashes, but also shows, as you said, had the near pick six, uh, was not perfect by any means. You see the potential, but understanding there's a lot of rawness here. He probably needs to sit. That seems like the ideal situation for the Titans to be in with him. Yeah, quite frankly, I think that's what made the pick of Malik Willis at number 86 in the third round so perfect for the Titans. The, The reality here is Malik Willis is not going to play his rookie year. Ryan Tannehill is a better player and gives the Titans a far better chance to win football games and accomplish their goals. But the the best part about it is Malik doesn't have to play. So yes, you're right. It would be ideal if Malik Willis lit it up in the preseason, showed all the flashes that you thought you would get when you drafted him, and then you truly do give him a full redshirt season behind Ryan Tannehill 
to learn all of the operational aspects of an NFL offense, to get the timing, the footwork, the, the improvements he does truly need to make to be an NFL quarterback. But again, being in Tennessee is the perfect situation because he can have all of the preseason reps and all those opportunities and practice to get better. And then he truly, truly, this isn't like other rookie quarterbacks where it's like, oh yeah, you got Andy Dalton. It's time to put in Justin Fields. No, he truly doesn't have to play. He can sit and rest. It is a perfect match between a quarterback prospect and an NFL situation. Stay up to date on the Tennessee Titans by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and the Locked On Titans podcast on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Coming up, how the Giants got out to a good start under new coach Brian Dable. Here's what to look for on Bet Online, your number one spot for all your gambling needs. The weekend brings preseason football. Tonight, the Arizona Cardinals travel to the newly named Paycor Stadium to take on the Cincinnati Bengals. Bet Online favors the home Bengals by two points in this one. Saturday night is the battle for LA with the Chargers and Rams facing off. Bet Online likes the Chargers by three and a half. Could be a Super Bowl preview. And Sunday has the Las Vegas Raiders hosting the Minnesota Vikings. Bet Online likes Vegas. By three and a half in that one. Bet online where the game starts. The NBA will honor Bill Russell by retiring the number six for all 30 teams the league announced on Thursday. Russell becomes the first player in NBA history to have his jersey retired league wide. Additionally, all NBA players will wear a commemorative patch on the right shoulder of their jerseys during the 2022-2023 season, and every court will display a shamrock-shaped logo with Russell's number six on the sideline near the scores table. A fitting tribute for one of the best basketball players, one of the best team sports players in history. On Thursday, Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coach Todd Bowles announced the quarterback Tom Brady will be away from the team for a period of time to, quote, deal with some personal things. Brady's absence was talked about in advance, and he will return to the team after next week's preseason matchup with the Tennessee Titans. When asked if it was related to Brady's health, the Bulls simply said, it's a personal issue, that's all I can tell you. He also said that his confidence level is very high that Brady will start week one for the Bucs against the Cowboys. It's doubtful that time missed in the preseason will have any effect on Brady's readiness for the regular season. But I have to point out here that the Buccaneers take on the Miami Dolphins. This weekend, they are practicing jointly with the Miami Dolphins. And you may remember Tom Brady recently embroiled in a scandal with the Miami Dolphins about trying to get to that team in a clandestine manner, a matter that cost the Dolphins a first round pick. And the field of dreams carried with it more nightmares of the present for the Cincinnati Reds as they fell to the Chicago Cubs. On a night made for dreams, the umpire turned it into a nightmare for the Reds. Hey, this is Jeff Carr from the Locked On Reds podcast, and you're probably wondering, Jeff, what are you even talking about? The game wasn't that bad as far as the umpires go, but there was one call in the first inning that I didn't see a lot of people complain about, but this just drove me nuts. The Reds got two quick outs. Nick Lodolo looked like he was about to cruise through the first three outs of the game. And then with two strikes on Patrick Wisdom, he delivered a beautiful slider that broke toward Patrick Wisdom's back foot. In fact, so much so it hit Patrick Wisdom in the back foot. But if you watch that replay, Wisdom tries to check his swing, but he doesn't. He comes through. He breaks the plane. His wrists even break forward a little bit. But the first base umpire says that he doesn't, that he held up. And so he awards him first. Then Seiya Suzuki gets an RBI double. The Cubs score two more runs, and the game is completely different from then on out. Nicoladolo scrambles for the rest of his start, and although it wasn't his best, I still was very impressed with how he scrambled and how he was able to deliver not having his best stuff and not having a feel and the kind of command that we're used to. I, I The Reds... Hitting with runners in scoring position was awful. That's something that has to improve the rest of the way or else they're going to continue this streak of terrible scoring. But for me, the game changed in the top of the first inning with that bad call. We're going to talk about that and more on tomorrow's Lockdown Reds podcast. Make sure you join Steve and I. 
A San Diego woman who alleges Trevor Bauer sexually abused her has filed a countersuit to his defamation claim, alleging the Dodgers pitcher beat her and left her bruised, according to a court filing. Bauer has denied abusing the woman he met through social media. He sued her for defamation in April. His suit claims she lied about details involving their sexual encounters in order to destroy his reputation and career while enriching herself. Major League Baseball has suspended Bauer for two years, a ruling made after Bauer sued the woman. Bauer has said he engaged in consensual rough sex with the woman, but did nothing to warrant a suspension. The woman's counter lawsuit demands a jury trial and unspecified damages. The New England Patriots fell to the New York Giants 23-21 in their preseason opener in a game that meant a lot less than some other Giants-Patriots games we might have seen in the past. Joining me now from Locked on Giants, Patricia Trena and, and Patricia, uh, this was the debut of Brian Dayball and his staff. It was also the debut of Daniel Jones in that new system. We saw Tyrod Taylor play and, and play well um, for, for a bit there as well. So what was what was your big takeaway from the debut of this new brain trust in New York? Yeah, well, I mean, as expected, Peter, they were very vanilla. You know, so all the pre-snap motion we saw, the fancy looks we've been seeing in practice, we knew we weren't going to see him in the games because why put him out there? And that went for the defense as well. But that said, the first team offense, I thought, uh, they got two series, and I thought they had a bit of a mixed bag. Daniel Jones uh, finished 6 of 10. I believe he finished, uh, uh, he was uh, 69 yards. He was sacked once, that on the second series when the tight end missed a block. But Daniel Jones's numbers probably could have been a little bit better if Kenny Galladay hadn't had a drop. Um, and it was a drop in the red zone of all places. It should have been a touchdown. They had to settle for, uh, you know, the 25-yard field goal. Not what you want to see, especially from a team that in the past, the red zone has been the dead zone for them. So, you know, that drive stalled. Um, otherwise, Daniel Jones made good decisions. He moved with his feet when he needed to. Uh, there were no turnovers, no penalties. So very encouraging um, performance, I think, from the first team offense, though you would have, have liked to have seen them score when they got in the red zone. We also got to see Saquon Barkley back on the field. You have been able to see him at practice. Did not put together impressive numbers, four rushes for 13 yards. Did have a catch as well for eight yards. How did you think Saquon looked out there? He looked healthy. He, you know, he decisive. Um, there weren't really many opportunities, I think, for him to really break one open. Uh, and again, the vanilla play calling kind of limited what he was doing. We saw a lot of runs, for example, up the gut which is not really his strength. So we didn't see some of these off tackle runs or misdirections or the fancy stuff we've been seeing in practice. So I just think, you know, it was a confidence builder for Saquon Barkley and for the coaching staff to look at him and say, yes, he looks like he's getting healthier and healthier at by the day. And this is a guy that, you know, was going to be a big part of this offense. Uh, they are really counting on him and you can just see the confidence growing day by day. I already saw it on Twitter the maybe maybe Tyrod Taylor is the best quarterback on this roster how much do you buy some of these questions that might be out there this this is not a, a team and a franchise now that has any loyalty to Daniel Jones right yeah Tyrod Taylor is by far the best backup they've had in in quite some time let's let's say that but you know here's the thing to remember um the Patriots did not play their starters so Jones and Tyrod Taylor both basically went up against the backups. And I believe Tyrod Taylor got more snaps than Daniel Jones did. So his numbers are going to look a little bit better. Um, you know, Tyrod Taylor, he's a starter. He's a, he's a starting caliber quarterback. There's no question about it. And if Jones ever goes down for any kind of length of time, he's a good option to fall back on, Taylor is. Um, am I ready to say that he is the best quarterback in camp? I, I don't think I would say that right now because, again, you got to put things into perspective. Um, but uh, certainly, you know, it, as a backup option, I feel a lot better with him than I did with the backups they had last year. Let's put it that way. Stay up to date on the New York Giants by subscribing to Locked On Sports today and the Locked On Giants podcast on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Coming up, Kevin Durant now has his sights set on Boston. Kevin Durant insists he's not going back to Brooklyn. We know that. So where will he go? He started with Phoenix. That was his preferred destination. Now his sights set much further east. As Locked On NBA continues to cover this news every day, host Nick Angstat and Pat the Designer explore the latest feelings from KD about becoming a Celtic. Kevin Durant sees the Celtics as a desired landing spot. He would also like to play with Marcus Smart if he's traded to the Celtics. So he wants them to keep Marcus Smart in a trade. He didn't like the Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart iteration of the deal. Yeah. Uh, because he doesn't want to be mellow 2.0, I guess. Uh, but what's your thoughts on, let's start with the Boston Celtics. What if Kevin Durant gets traded to the Boston Celtics? The the thing that you have to question in that, in that whole thing, right? Because we know what KD is going to bring. We know what KD is, right? The thing that you have to question is, is Jason Tatum going to be the Jason Tatum of the finals? Or is Jason Tatum going to be the Jason Tatum that kind of led us up to the playoffs? If you look at Jason's numbers, well, yeah, he did play well the entire playoffs, right? Yeah. There was a consistent downtick from the first round all the way to the NBA finals. Of course, injury plays a part in there, right? And different things like that. But you have to ask yourself, is that enough? Is that enough to get the job done? Because KD's the ultimate teammate. KD's one of the best players at being a you do whatever you do that makes you great. Fits anywhere. Fits with any superstar and of any And I'll still era. get you 30. Yeah. It, it's amazing to me. So I, I look at that as a, a, a situation where I feel like the pieces around it could help you win. But then the question comes in, right, like, are you just kind of revamping the same situation that you currently had? I mean, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum got you to an NBA Finals. I find this report really interesting that he said, first of all, that it's no longer the Suns, it's the Celtics is his desired landing spot, if this report yeah, no, is right. true. But then it's Marcus, <laughs> he wants to play with Marcus Smart and not Jason Tatum. And you know, he said he wants to play with Marcus Smart because he doesn't want Marcus Smart included in the deal. I referenced the Corma Anthony trade, and it's the trade from when Melo was in Denver, and then got traded to the Knicks. And the Knicks traded Wilson Chandler, Gallinari, Raymond Felton, Mozgov when he was good. <laughs> they traded you know, a couple picks and all that, first-round picks. Um, by the way, the, the pick that became Jamal Murray, that's a pretty good one. Just wait a year, Melo. But just yeah, wait one gonna, year. You gotta just wait it. And so he doesn't. KD doesn't want to go to a team that gets gutted, losing yeah. both Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart. And so you kind of get it, but it is, it is a little laughable. To me, this is about Kevin Durant's desperation. The Nets do not want to send him somewhere that cannot return a package worthy of a player of Kevin Durant's caliber. The Suns almost certainly can't do that without getting other teams involved. Now it's Philadelphia, it's Boston. It is about desperation. Kevin Durant wants to go anywhere that's not the Brooklyn Nets. And it's still unclear why exactly that's the case. But this is what we're dealing with when it comes to Kevin Durant. He just doesn't want to be in Brooklyn. So the list has to expand, okay? There is no deal for Phoenix, okay? On to the next team. Now it's Jalen Brown. Is he enough to get Kevin Durant? And all of these questions about fit and what version of Jason Tatum are you going to get? Those are nice questions for Boston to have. From Kevin Durant's standpoint, it's about where can I get to? And he had said previously, Boston was just never happening. He told Bill Simmons, noted Celtics fan, a couple years ago, Boston was never in the mix. Almost laughed at the idea of going to Boston. And now it's part of the, the preferred list? It is desperation time for Kevin Durant because, unfortunately for him, the Nets, they hold all the cards. And finally, New England Patriots running back James White, a three-time Super Bowl champion, announced his retirement from the NFL on Thursday after eight seasons. White will always be remembered for that crazy comeback against the Atlanta Falcons when he set three Super Bowl records, most receptions with 14, most points scored as an individual with 20, and most touchdowns. Tom Brady posted a congratulatory message on Instagram saying, congrats on the perfect career at Sweet Feet, James White's handle. He also, by the way, should have been Super Bowl MVP of that Super Bowl. Thanks for making Locked On Sports today your first listen. Now go find your favorite team's Locked On podcast and make them your second listen. Coming up Monday, who had the best start to the NFL preseason? 
So at least until tomorrow, stay locked on sports today. Locked on Podcast Network and Odyssey present Locked on Sports Today. 